Starts right now, so fling wide you heavenly gates and prepare the way of the risen Lord. The Apostle John was on the island of Patmos. He was in prison for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he heard a sound behind him and said, Behold, I looked. There was a door standing open in heaven. And I heard a voice, which was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here and I will show you the things which must take place. That's what we need, my friends. We need a heavenly perspective of the things that are going on in the world around us. The things that the Word of God foretold us would come to pass. Those things which must take place. Those things which are taking place even now. That is what this broadcast is all about, discussing the issues of the day, discerning the times in which we live from a biblical perspective and worldview. Good day, everybody. Andy White here. What you are about to hear is the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. I want to welcome everybody from all across the fruited plain and all around the spherical globe. Thanks for tuning in to this week's edition of Open Up The Doors, and I am streaming live over on my Open Up The Doors Facebook page at facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. If you've never liked the page, please like the page and go on over there and join in the conversation. Let me know where you are watching from. Give a wave, give a meet and greet over there at my uh, Open Up The Doors Facebook page. You can also follow me on Truth Social at AJ White if you're on that platform. And if you are outside of the Faith FM broadcast area, best way to listen to Faith FM is to download the free Faith FM app, which we do have for the Apple and Android platforms. Find them at your respective app distributor as well. Look up Faith FM in Sag Harbor because there are others that um, are out there named Faith FM. But we are broadcasting from the east end of Long Island. I do plan on going to the phones in the second hour if you want to jot down the uh phone number right now so you have it and be the first kid on the block to call in phone number is 631-725-2069 631-725-2069 all right so let me get to it this is going to be uh a very serious and a very sobering broadcast today. In fact, I think it might be, I don't know, in my spirit, I feel like it might be one of the most important broadcasts I've ever done. But, excuse me, we are at the time of year when we'll be turning our our, our, our clocks back. (laughs) Yeah, it's very serious here. I'm stumbling over my words already. But we're at that time of the year when we will be turning our clocks back, believe it or not, this coming Sunday. But it seems to me that many people have already put their clocks back, back to 1930s Germany. As I said, I want to ask you to pay extra close attention to this broadcast today. I've got a lot in my spirit, and I've really been praying asking the Lord how to deliver it. I want to, well, I'll leave it in the Lord's hands and pray that he would just use me as imperfect a vessel as I am. But I fervently believe that one of the greatest pastoral responsibilities in this hour that we have is to be preparing the church to face the great challenges that are not just coming, but are here now. And there's many of them, but one of those challenges will be and is how we will, both as individual Christians and the larger corporate body of Christ, respond to the rising onslaught of anti-Semitism and the persecution 
of Jews that is already here. And yet it will increase in the days ahead, sorry to say, because, but the scriptures tell us it will. The challenge and the question I want to raise today is this. What side of history will we find ourselves on? Will we be on the wrong side of history? Will we be like the majority of the German churches in Nazi Germany that when they saw and heard the freight trains rolling down the tracks by their churches with the cries of multitudes of Jews who were being transported to the concentration camps, but the pastors and the congregations, the pastors would exhort the congregation to sing a little louder in order to drown out the cries of the Jews. Sing a little louder. Come on, sing a little louder. Well, folks, I, for one, I'm not going to be one who's just going to sing a little louder to blot out what's going on around me. I'm not going to be one who chooses to look the other way as though those things aren't happening. I'm not going to be one to sing a little louder, but I purpose in myself to be one who will shout a whole lot louder. Shout, lift up your voices. Like it says in the book of Proverbs 31, open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth and plead the cause of the poor and needy. At the risk of making a blanket statement, it is my personal observation and experience that something in the church called replacement theology is at the root of a rising anti-Zionism in the church. And there are those among our ranks who are not standing with Israel or the Jewish people because they have accepted the errors of replacement theology. It is very troubling to me to see some who profess to be Bible-believing Christians embrace a subtle and sometimes not so subtle form of anti-Semitism, which is, a thin, which is thinly veiled behind the errant and egregiously false teaching of replacement theology. I'm not going to get into what that is at the moment. And I'm also not suggesting that every anti-Zionist is a de facto anti-Semite. But it is clear to me that all anti-Semites are anti-Zionist. And there is a clear connection between these positions. Anti-Zionism logically leads to anti-Semitism. And though some will, in fact, that they, they, they will deny that they are anti-Semitic, yet the lines between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism become very blurry when one begins to listen to their rhetoric. Israel is a Jewish state. And if you are against the Jewish state, and believe that its very existence is illegitimate, or at best you see it as some call it a fake Jewish state, then you are rejecting their homeland. And if you are attacking the state of Israel and rejecting their homeland, you are in effect attacking the Jews. Ergo, you are anti-Semitic, whether you realize it or admit it or not. It's really simply that simple. Shakespeare famously said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Likewise, anti-Semitism by any other name is still a stench. In many ways, we're seeing a repeat of the 1930s. But I do want to be a little positive here. In many ways, I'm also seeing that many of us have learned those lessons as well. And I am happy to see that there are Christians and there are churches that are standing up. I hope it continues. 
I am happy to see that much of the majority of the church is not turning their eyes away. And they're not just simply singing a little louder. But I hope and I pray it remains that way because it'll get harder and harder in the days ahead. And yet, though I do see these gleams of hope, do I, though I do see these rays of hope, do I do see those who are standing up? Yet having said that, sadly, there's still a considerable number of Christians and churches that have given themselves over to the wrong side of history, both due to that wrong theology of replacement theology and a wrong, which leads ultimately to a wrong eschatology. As I said, I'm not going to address that today per se, but I do want to admonish and reprove those who hold to these ideas. And I also want to encourage and exhort those who know the truth to continue to stand in the truth. And in standing in the truth, and in standing for the truth, you may quickly find out who's really with you and who is not. It may cost you some relationships. Listen up, brothers and sisters. Do not equivocate on this issue. This is not a mere difference of opinion over some minor issue. Are you going to be on the wrong side of history or on the right side of history? This past week, I had to block and ban several people from my various social media platforms. Because if there's one thing I will not tolerate, not even for a second, it's anti-Semitism and Jew bashing. I won't countenance it even for a moment, nor will I hesitate to delete, block, and ban you. Your anti-Semitic tropes, your blood libels, your Jewish cabal conspiracy theories. Sorry, not sorry. I won't tolerate it. I will call it out. And I won't be gracious about it either. Because this is not just a mere matter of opinion. It's not a mere matter, difference of opinion in, 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 in these minor issues. And if that offends some people, if it causes me to quote unquote lose followers on Facebook or Truth or wherever, or even listeners of this broadcast, so be it. Now, I don't want you to go away. I want you to keep listening that the truth, truth might penetrate you. Some people are saying to me I shouldn't be banning and blocking people that, that off my pages because they need to hear the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. I've engaged with them. It's not like I just ban them without engaging with them. No, but when they persist in their blasphemous lies, I will not use my platforms to be a platform for them. I am called to expose the unfruitful works of darkness, not have fellowship with them. Last few weeks, I've had to call out in public some of these so-called Christians who had made comments on my posts. And I'm going to say it in no uncertain terms. If you call yourself a Christian, yet you post and make anti-Jewish slurs and twist and pervert scripture verses to justify your anti-Semitism, you're a disgrace in my eyes to the cause of Christ and to the gospel. You trample upon and you pervert the scriptures according to your own deception and damnation. And you need, if you're falling in this category, you need to go and fall on your knees with your face in a Bible opened up to the very least. Romans chapters 9 through 11, and pray that God would open your eyes to see and receive a heart to understand his heart for the natural branches. Paul wrote, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. And yet, it seems sadly that many are. So here we are. Here we are from major cities around the world and even here in America, 
to college campuses, to all around the globe, the satanically inspired Jew hatred is reaching 1930s proportions. And since the 10-7 attack on Israel, anti-Semitic incidents are up 400% in America. The chanting throngs reciting and repeating the genocidal mantra of from the river to the sea are on the wrong side of history, my friends. You've seen these pictures. They're going around Facebook, these, these uh, social media. They're, going, they're all over the place, all these pictures, hundreds of them, thousands of them. But there are these clueless imbeciles, and that's what they are. These clueless imbeciles who hold up LGBTQ rainbow signs saying, quote, Allah loves equality and a, a big one, queers for Palestine. These people are painfully stupid. They really are. Hamas and the Islamists would cut off their heads faster than they could say LGBT. These people holding up these signs, they think they're, they're so woke. They think they're so, so, uh, so uh, I guess woke's the word they want to use, but it's a sad display of mindlessness. These useful idiots, they're clueless. I saw someone ask the question in a post. Who could imagine anybody celebrating the beheading of babies nor, nor thousands of Americans, often at elite universities, denouncing Israel as an apartheid, genocidal, colonial regime. They asked the question, who could, any, who, who could imagine anybody celebrating this? Well, I could imagine it. I, for one. Because for years, I've been warning and talking about the, this rising danger of, of Islam and its eschatological, antichrist, spiritual agenda for years. People will never understand the problem nor the issue if they don't understand and if they choose to ignore the fact that it's a spiritual and cosmic issue. Islam at its core is both antichrist and anti-Semitic. It's an ideology spawned in hell. So we see the News reports mounting every day by the hundreds of reports. Last week, Jewish students barricaded themselves in the school library in uh, a New York City college. What was the college they did that in? Cooper Union College in New York. Students, Jewish students, had to barricade themselves in the, in, in the school library to hide from the anti-Jewish Hamas supporters. They were marching through the building, banging on doors, banging on the library doors with protesters, banging on and chanting, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, amongst other things, from the river to the sea. That's a genocidal saying written right into the Hamas charter. Do these people even understand what they're saying? A lot of them do. But as as this was happening at this college, as these Jewish students were locked in the school library, sitting in fear, the police, the police had been called, but they waited for 40 minutes because they were afraid to get involved. Can you imagine? The police were afraid to get involved. In another incident, Jewish students at Cornell received death threats. I'm sure many of you heard of this. With Cornell University police and the FBI investigating a series of threats made against the school's Jewish community. Reports are, as of yesterday, this, this, the uh, person who was making these threats, he was caught. But these threats were posted in a, in a website not affiliated with the universe, but they targeted the, the, the Jewish community community on Cornell, at Cornell University. And this person posted, made phone calls, whatever he did, but he said that uh, he wanted to slit 
the throats of Jews, adding that rats need to be eliminated from Cornell, and that he would rape the Jewish women and then throw them off the building, which is what um, Islamists do around the world. And then it builds more and more. Last Saturday here in New York, thousands of pro-Palestinian protesters forced city officials to close the Brooklyn Bridge down as they gathered in New York City. All lanes on the Brooklyn Bridge were closed in both directions. And protesters were, well, I saw the pictures, they were climbing up to the top of the, uh, of the Brooklyn Bridge. But they were holding signs by any means necessary. And New York City stands with Gaza while waving Palestinian flags. That's just here in our own country, in our, and in, in New York. But going around the world, the Associated Press reported open hatred of Jews surges globally, inflamed by Gaza war. In Los Angeles, a man screaming killed Jews attempted to break into a family's home. In London, girls playing uh, in a playground were, t- were told that they were stinking Jews as people walked by, these girls playing, and they should stay off the, they should, they should stay off the slide. Stay off the slide, you stinking Jews. This is in London. Not, not, not 1930s Berlin. In China, posts likening Jews to parasites and vampires and snakes proliferate on social media, attracting thousands of likes. The Associated Press referred to a Muslim mob storing a, uh, storming a Russian airport last week as simply a protest. Simply a protest, that's all it was. Hundreds of pro-Palestinian people stormed the main airport in Russia's Dagestan region, shouting anti-Semitic slurs and calling and shouting out, kill, kills, kill Israelis, kill Jews. And the AP just said it was a protest. They were going around opening up cars, looking for Jews to pull them out of the taxi cabs. Muslims in this region of Russia. I'm just starting. I'm going to go to a break, take a little bit of a Selah moment. But I came across a comment by author Travis Snow, who I've mentioned from time to time. He's got a great book out, uh, 70 Year Jubilee, based uh, a study on the uh, 70th week of Daniel. But I came across, I stumbled upon this, this post that Travis put out there on social media and it really just completely resonated with me and what I wanted to share today. But Travis said this, there's this idea that one can merely keep silent and stay uninvolved in this foreign war and not choose sides so that we can keep focusing on the gospel and the essential matters of the faith, quote unquote. But this attitude represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the historical moment. Will we be on the right side of history? That's my commentary on his comment. Or we, will we be on the wrong side of history? Travis goes on to say, this is a moment to speak on behalf of the Jewish people in Israel. But just as importantly, it is also a moment to prepare for the greatest storms on the horizon. That's how I began this block at the top of the show. There is no escaping the issue of Israel and the impact it will have on the church worldwide in the days ahead. This issue is at our doorstep and it is not going away. No, not at all. You got that right, Travis. But folks, I'll be back with a whole lot more. I'm going to take a little bit of a Selah break here. Chill out. Here's a tune by Hillsong called No One Like You. Keep it right here on Faith FM and I'll be back. Hill song. There is no one like you, Jesus. He's our only hope, church. He's our only peace. He is our eternal Savior. Welcome back, Andy White here on the radio, Tearing Down Strongholds. You are listening to Open Up the Doors, Integrity in Broadcasting here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in that peak, WEGQ 
91.7 in Quag. And I'm going to continue with my, with what I have on my plate for today. Because it's incredibly important. But I want to lay out not only the, the historical elements and foundations of really what we're seeing today. But again, how are we to respond in light of all of the things that we know? Because anti-Semitism, folks, is not just evil. Oh, it is evil. But it's hellishly evil. And what's even more infuriating to me is when I see it in professing Christians. When I see a quote-unquote Christian spreading, uh, spreading these Jewish cabal conspiracy theories or the nonsensical Kazarian myth, and it is a myth, You see it all over, but it's a complete fabrication that has been debunked by scholars. I'm not going to get into that this morning. Four years ago, I did a broadcast back in 2019 called Israel Exists and They're Not Fake Jews. And I got into the whole Kazarian myth thing and went through some scholarly stuff. Yet people cling to this nonsense. But go look that up. Like I said, I'm not going to reiterate all of that now. But. When it comes to modern day anti-Semitism in the church, in large measure, you can trace it back to Martin Luther. That might shock some people. But Martin, Martin Luther's legacy wasn't only the Protestant Reformation. People were celebrating him the other day because it was Reformation Day. I never celebrate Martin Luther. I know it's a complicated history, but there's nothing in me that wants to celebrate the guy personally. God used him like he uses all of us in spite of our failings. But here's the side of Martin Luther that many don't know because his legacy isn't only the Protestant Reformation. His legacy also eventually led to the Holocaust. His virulent anti-Semitic pamphlet that he wrote. He titled a little booklet called The Jews and Their Lies. And that booklet was used by Hitler some 400 or 500 years later. By Hitler, it was used in the Nazis as their playbook to justify their atrocities. There was a a propaganda poster that was posted around Germany in 1933. I found a picture of it. It's a picture of of Martin Luther. And in the background, there's a Nazi flag with a swastika on it. And the, 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 the Nazis put this propaganda poster around Berlin, around all of Germany. And it said this on the on the poster. Hitler's fight and Luther's teaching are the best defense for the German people. Selah. Martin Luther wrote on the Jews and their lies in 1543, long before there was a Nazi Germany. Luther deeply deplored, in his mind, Christendom's failure to expel the Jews from his nation. And so he proceeded to write a book with, in which he proposed the following question. I had a question today at the top of my show. What side of history will you be on? Martin Luther asked this question. What then shall we Christians do with this damned, rejected race of Jews? Here's just a few of Luther's solutions to the Jewish problem. And this is just a few. I'm not going to go through the whole booklet. But this is what the father of the Reformation wrote regarding the Jewish problem. First, their synagogues should be set on fire and whatever does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one may ever be able to see a cinder block or stone of it. Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed for they 
perpetrate the same things there that they do in their synagogues. For this reason, they ought to be put under one roof or in a stable like gypsies in order that they may realize that they are not masters in our land as they boast, but they are miserable captives. In 1543, Martin Luther wrote those words that I just read to you. On the night of November 9th, 1938, the sounds of breaking glass shattered the air in cities throughout Germany and parts of Austria. It became, it came to be known as Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. And the Nazis went around and, and while fires, fires across the country devoured synagogues. Well, that's what Martin Luther said to do, isn't it? While fires across the country devoured synagogues and Jewish institutions by the end of the rampage gangs of Nazi stormtroopers had destroyed 7,000 Jewish businesses set fire to more than 900 synagogues killed 91 Jews and deported some 30,000 Jewish men to concentration camps and a report back to the State Department a few days later, a U.S. official in Leipzig uh, described what he saw of the atrocities, quote, having demolished dwellings and hurled most of the movable effects to the streets, our State Department official wrote, the insatiability, the insatiably sadistic perpetrators threw many of the trembling Jews into a small stream that flows through the zoological park, commanding horrified spectators to spit on them, defile them with mud and jeer at their plight. People don't want to talk about the writings of Martin Luther when it comes to this little booklet he put out. But I want to play a little game. I want to take a few minutes to play a little game here, kind of like the game show in the 60s. That for those, of you, for those of you who are old enough to remember the what's my line, we're going to do a little game here. I'm going to ask a question. Who said this? And those of you on Facebook, if you want to, you know, shoot out a quick answer, I'll, I'll try and try and keep a look on my on my stream there. But let's 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 play this little game. Who said this? The ultimate goal must definitely be the removal of Jews altogether. Bam, 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 bam. Anybody want to take a stab at who said that? The ultimate goal must definitely be the removal of Jews altogether. Okay, folks, that would have been Adolf Hitler. So let's see. Who said this? Who said this? Quote, passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Anybody want to take a crack on Facebook? Um, Joni, you got the first one wrong. That was Hitler. But, 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 you got the second one right. Who said this? Passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Yeah, that was Martin Luther in his little booklet, What to Do of the Jews in Their Lives. So let me give a, another quote here. Hence today, I believe that I am acting in accordance with the will of Almighty God. By defending myself against the Jew, I am fighting for the work of the Lord. Mm, now who said that? Any, any, anybody on Facebook want to give a gander? Who said, I believe that I'm acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator by defending myself against the Jew? I am fighting for the work of the Lord. Yeah, that would have been Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf, as a matter of fact. He goes on to say, in Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler, for us, it is a problem of whether our nation can ever recover its health, whether the Jewish spirit can ever really be eradicated. Don't be misled into thinking you can fight a disease without killing the carrier, without destroying the bacillus. Don't think you can fight racial tuberculosis without taking care to rid the nation of the carrier of that racial tuberculosis. This Jewish contamination will not subside. This poisoning of the nation will not end until the carrier himself, the Jew, has been banished from our midst. That's right out of Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler. Let's go, let's, let's try a few more here. Let's try a few more here. Here's a quote for you. Such a desperate, 
thoroughly evil, poisonous, and devilish lot are these Jews who for these, this might give it away, who for these 1400 years have been and still are our plague, our pestilence, and our misfortune. That sounds a lot like what Adolf Hitler wrote, except it was written back in 1533 by Martin Luther. Shall I go on? How much time I got here? I'm running out of time. I, I think it, I think I got more here. I got I got lots more here, but I think you get the you get the gist. You get the gist of where I'm going with this, and why we've got to stand up and learn the lessons of history. In 1922, Hitler, before he ever rose to power, roughly 10 or 11 years later. Hitler said in 1922, if I am ever really in power, the destruction of the Jews will be my first and most important job. As soon as I have power, I shall have gallows after gallows erected. Then the Jews will be hanged one after another and they will stay hanging until they stink. Not literally, of course, but by way of analogy, Hitler was hung on his own gallows, much like his predecessor Haman was in the book of Esther. You know the story. Once Haman's plan was exposed, the king allowed the Jews to arm and defend themselves. Was it an interesting uh, fact a couple of weeks ago that after the Hamas attack, the Israeli government lifted the gun restrictions in Israel and allowed the citizens to arm themselves, much like what you read in the book of Esther, Again, don't have the time to read it. Go read Esther chapters 8 through 9. Because from Esther to, to, to Hitler in the 1930s, there's the same spirit at work. But King Ahasuerus allowed the Jews, you know the story, to go and arm themselves and to, and to defend themselves. And it says in Esther 9, 3, and all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those during doing the king's work helped the Jews. It's funny, I came across this and then I'll take a quick break. I read a story the other day how formally, formally, anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment, uh, anti-Second Amendment liberal Jews have all of a sudden started buying guns. They've been going to the gun stores and buying them off the racks. Here's a quote. Uh, uh da, 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 da. where is that quote uh, well basically this i got so much stuff here one guy says i can't believe i was i i, I was so anti-gun but after seeing what's going on i bought a gun and i'm going down to the shooting range to learn how to use it and he was a liberal jew who was anti-gun until now See, American Jews can see what is happening in Europe, even as large numbers of Muslims have entered European countries. With, and as, as, the, as the Muslim population increases, the anti-Jewish violence increases. So I want to close out this portion right now, take another break, and ask some simple questions. Why should we stand with Israel? Well, which side of history do you want to be on? 5,000 years of history ought to show us why we should stand with the Jewish people. Throughout the Jewish history, those that have sought the destruction of the Jews have time and time again been on the wrong side of history. Who can curse what God has blessed? You say that Israel is no longer under the careful attention of God? Well, the scriptures prove you wrong, my friends. This has been proven true for 5,000 years. And it would be smart. It would be smart to be on the right side of history. Ask Pharaoh, ask Balak, ask Goliath, ask Haman, ask Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And there are many and plenty more I could mention. Ask Antiochus Epiphanes, and of course, Adolf Hitler. And yes, and yes, foreboding, there is one on the horizon that will be worse than them all. 
So make sure, brothers and sisters, you find yourself on the right side of history. Because in the end, it won't go well for the one who's coming and his followers either. And the going may get rough for us as well. But this is why I want to speak when I'm speaking. I want to urge you to gird yourselves, to prepare yourselves with conviction and with courage. I'll be back in a moment. Stick around. The fusion of heart, mind, and soul. This is Open Up the Doors with Andy White here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7, 93.3 in that peak, and WEGQ 91.7 in quad. Really quickly, by way of broadcast memo, the first hour of this broadcast re airs today at 3 p.m. Thursday and 1 p.m. again on Saturday. And if you've never uh, li- uh, subscribed to or liked my YouTube channel and my Rumble channel, I would I would invite you to do so. These broadcasts do get uploaded on both YouTube and Rumble for your listening leisure and pleasure at a later point in time. Also to share, to please share. These are, these are meant to be resources for you guys, the body of Christ. You can go back and listen to them over and over, take down notes, but share them with people that you think uh, would, would, would benefit from them. That's what it's about. So again, if you've never subscribed to my YouTube channel and my Rumble channel, just look me up, Andy White, open up the doors, hit the little bell over there on YouTube. You'll be notified when we upload these uh, archived uh, broadcasts uh, and Rumble notifies you as well. Again, I'm going to go to the phones in the second hour, 631-725-2069. If you would like to call in, be part of the broadcast, I would love to hear your thoughts, your input on this very important subject matter. I would like, usually when I open the phones, I open up, I open them up to any question on any topic. I'd like to stay focused on this for today. Six three one seven two five two zero six nine. Let's have a conversation about these things. And I'm going to close out this first hour. I got I got about ten minutes left, and I want to share some things, really from my heart, both in relation to the church, us as believers, and also an appeal to my Jewish friends, who may or just accidentally even be listening to this broadcast. But first this, back in January of this year, I talked about how the Lord was looking to raise up a Corey Ten Boom generation. Little did I realize in January, and now 10 months later, as we begin November, just how quickly that need was going to come about. I had, I had a, friend, a friend of mine contact me about a month ago, right after the Hamas attacks in Israel, he, he contacted me. He lives in another state. He actually lives on the other side of the country. But he sent, me a, he sent me a text saying that he had friends, Jewish friends, in New York City. The, the friend who contacted me was a believer. He, but he contacted me about Jewish friends that, um, I don't know if they were believers or not. He just said he had Jewish friends that were, Things were breaking out in New York City, the, uh, the, the, the protests, the anti-Semitism, and he said they wanted to get out of the city, but they, uh, they really didn't have any place to go if I would take them in. I'm not saying this to boast of myself. I'm just saying this, this so much talks into what we just talked about back in January. And if I, 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 of course, said I would take people in if they, needed, if they needed a place of refuge, if they needed to get out of the city. Uh, you know, I have, I have an extra room. I would take them in. Um, gladly, gladly, nothing came of that but we talked about this in fred london's book that we we i had fred london on back in january and we talked about these very things but in his book uh morning comes then night he said this in the future many will trans uh many in the future many will transition into places of refuge, forming a network of Corey Ten Boom type hiding places, 
dispersed throughout the world, they will serve as a last day's ministry, functioning as a type of underground church, an underground railroad, as they begin to transition into places and networks of refuge. And he wrote this, this is no fantasy, but a prophetic reality. These are some of the practical things, not just not just rhetorically standing up, saying we're, we're with Israel, not just not just plastering memes. That's all good. But are, are you preparing yourself to truly be a friend that sticks closer than a brother? Jesus said, and it's, it's, in, the, it's in the context of the Olivet Discourse, it is the Olivet Discourse, when he talks about the sheeps and the goats. I mentioned this last week, where he says, if you... If you've done this to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Well, you might say, well, well, Jews aren't saved. In the flesh, they're Jesus' brethren. Paul said, I, I cry for my brethren in the flesh. Sometimes we just want to hyper-spiritualize so much in the New Testament and not look down to the, to the, to, to the, the brass tacks. Who is my neighbor, the Good Samaritan? We went through that, I believe, last week. So I want to ask the question and raise the question once again. Are we as Christians, are we as a church preparing ourselves for these challenges? Will we stand both in the conviction of our faith and with the courage that it will take? Some have said that education is the answer to solving anti-Semitism. Germany prove that to be a fallacy. It can be argued that pre-World War II Germany was the most sophisticated, educated, and cultured society of the time. Many of the greatest intellectuals, educators, authors, philosophers, inventors, engineers, scientists, those of the arts, along with theologians, were produced in Germany, some of whom became part of the leadership of the Nazi regime. It was not a lack of education. Never has been. It's a heart problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a satanically inspired cosmic problem. And I want to share my heart with this. Again, to those who might be Jewish and you're not believers in Messiah. But I want to share my heart. In the New Testament, Romans 10, Paul, who was a rabbi, Paul, who sat at the feet of... Gamaliel as a Pharisee. Paul cried out in Romans, brother in my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That's the ethos of my spirit with Paul's. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Many non-believing Jews by that I mean Jews who don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah look at evangelical Christians who support Israel with some suspicion and skepticism believing that we have an agenda and in one sense we do but let me speak for myself if you happen to be hearing this please hear my heart I do have an agenda when it comes to Israel and the Jews. But it's not some nefarious thing. It's not that I want you to abandon your heritage or your traditions or the things that make you Jewish. Quite the opposite. I want you to see the fullness and completeness of what it means to be Jewish. I desire for you that you might find and realize what is the crown of your Jewishness. You might be thinking, what is this foolish Gentile talking about? Well, Moses and the prophets said that in the last days that you would be provoked to jealousy through a foolish people and a foreign tongue. I want you to know and I want you to experience the salvation that is found in Jesus the Messiah. And this foolish goyim, this foolish goy, this, this, this foreign tongue in a way, that's what I am in a very small measure of what Moses and the prophets talked about. 
I want you to find the joy and the salvation that is found in Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. I want you to be saved in order to be saved from the wrath which is coming, the wrath to come. And I pray that your eyes would be opened. I pray that the Lord God would open your eyes, open your hearts, because Paul, who was thoroughly Jewish, said that it was God who's blinded your eyes. So I understand the veil that's there, but we're in a time where the, where the veil is being removed. And the promise of Moses is that the promise th- that your eyes would be open as well. Moses, in Psalm 91, wrote this. He said, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The Hebrew word for salvation in that very place of which Moses wrote in Psalm 91 is Yeshua. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my Yeshua. That's the Messiah's name. And I pray that God would indeed, my Jewish friends, very much show you his Yeshua. There's so much there that might trouble your spirit, I understand. But understand that it's a sincere desire for you to know in a way you've never known before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God in whom I believe, the God of Israel of whom I stand with. And I pray his blessings upon you, no matter where you are. But I'll be back for hour two, so keep it right here on Faith FM, folks.